tremendously great pleasure to welcome Evangeline Marku back to the ANS. In fact, when she was um, when she arrived the other day, I was trying to remember when it was she was here last, and we had um, welcomed her here. I guess it was about seven or eight years ago. So, 2010. Yeah. 2010. Yeah. So it's it's been a been a while, but uh, I have to say it's it's been far too long. It's uh, wonderful to have her back in New York. Um, she is. Um, a tremendously accomplished scholar. She uh, works right now for the National Hellenic Research Foundation in Athens, Greece, in the Institute of H Historical Research um, within the section of Greek and Roman Antiquities, or Kara, as the, uh, as the Greek, um, um, uh, Greek uh, uh, abbreviation is. Um, among other th publications, Evie has an absolutely wonderful monograph that was published a few years ago um, on the gold coinage of the Hellenistic kings, or gold coinage of the Cypriot kings, sorry, uh, which um, was published in French um, by um, uh, Metalemata, if I remember right. Um, but in addition to her uh, print publication, she has more recently been working on an absolutely wonderful um, online database of uh, Cypriot's history, archaeology, and of course numismatics. And uh, this is called Kiprios Character. Um, the data, the um, website is kiprioscharacter.eie.gr, if I remember correctly. Um, do please check this out. This is an absolutely uh, wonderful and tremendously useful database on um, uh, all things Cypriot in antiquity, and she is here this week uh, doing some work uh, on our collection to include that uh, material from our collection into that database. So it is my tremendously great pleasure again to welcome her to um, talk to us tonight on new observations in archaic and classical period Cypriot coinage. That'd be all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I have to bring the microphone down. I hope that you can all listen to me well. And uh, I would like to thank very much uh, Ute and Peter for their welcome here in the ANS uh, in my second visit. Uh, I was here just for a few days, but it's a good opportunity for me to present to you uh, the Cypriot coinage, an overview and some new observations on the archaic and classical coinage of Cyprus, which is very interesting, very intriguing, and problematic at the same time, as we will see. So in today's presentation, I will present just a brief introduction about the position of Cyprus in the Eastern Mediterranean, the existence of various kingdoms and kings ruling in these kingdoms from the uh, Assyrian period down to the late, early Hellenistic time. And uh, we will see together the earliest coinages. We will look at uh, different inscriptions, iconography, and uh, we will discuss uh, the weight standard used by the kings of Cyprus during the archaic uh, period, during the fifth century. And then we will discover the changes that take place during the 4th century BC, together with some discussions on hoards and coin circulation of the Cypriot coinages in Cyprus and abroad. Uh, the website that uh, um, Peter mentioned before is a project that started in 2014, <laughs> and it has been evolving since, uh, where uh, coins from various coin collections, as well as papers, original papers regarding Cypriot archaeology, history, and numismatics are uploaded uh, frequently. Uh, I invite you to search and contact me for any questions or uh, information. So I always start with this map of Cyprus at the far end of the Eastern Mediterranean and at a very close proximity with, at a pr proximity with the coasts of Cilicia, of Phoenicia, of Egypt, and the Aegean, the history of the island has developed and has been influenced by that strategic position. Everybody around the island and all the great rulers <laughs> 
wanted to take advantage of this position, of the fact that Cyprus had ports and navy, and the island was very rich in timber and in copper through, throughout the antiquity, which was a very important trading source and negotiation source also. Um, so during the Assyrian period, that's from the 8th and the 7th century BC, uh, the kingdoms that uh, appear to be active in Cyprus through epigraphic testimonies are the following uh, ones. And we know of their existence because of, um, excuse me, of uh, epigraphic documentation that was found in the island, like the prism of Esarchadon, and uh, we know of the kingdoms and the kings ruling at these separate kingdoms that are under the control of the Assyrian king. Later on, in the 6th and 5th century, Cyprus is under Persian control. The number of kingdoms changes, the position of the kingdoms changes as well, as well for reasons that we know of from the sources epigraphic, philological, and uh, numismatic uh, testimonies, uh, but also for reasons that remain unknown to us. And we try to understand, sometimes without any result, unless new data comes along. So the prism of Esarchadon, that is dated in the 7th century, names the following kingdoms in Cyprus, while the Othoros, in the middle of the 5th century, mentions that in 351 the ten kings of Cyprus revolted against, against the great king of Persia together with uh, the satraps in the great satrap revolt without naming the kingdoms or the kings but we learn from other sources and a combination of sources that these kingdoms are different. Actually he mentions of nine kingdoms in Cyprus that were uh, under the control of the kings of Persia, of the king of Persia. So actually, if one notices, uh, in the fourth century BC, the four kingdoms that existed in the center of the island, that is, these four kingdoms actually disappear. They don't, they don't disappear, to be honest. They are included in the areas of control of the neighboring kingdoms for reasons that we will see later on in detail. Some of them we know why. Uh, one shouldn't forget that this area there where Tamasos is, is an area rich in copper. And these kingdoms, that's Kition and Salamis, were always trying to get closer to those sources of copper. So the fifth century BC coinages are known to us, and we will see several examples in detail, although some of the kingdoms, we don't know, we're not certain if they issued coins, or for some of them, for example, Kirinia, we can't attribute at all any coinages whatsoever. And we will see some examples, and we will see where this problem comes from. The Cypriot coinages have, at least those of the fifth century, have two scripts on it. The Cypriot syllabic script, that's a local syllabary used to put into writing the Greek language, and the Phoenician script. In both those scripts, the names, the royal names, the names of the kings who are responsible for issuing coins in Cyprus, are preceded by either in Cypriot syllabic script this complete legend or by the first symbol. And uh, this legend reads pa si le, wo, se, and that's the genitive of the king, of the royal title. The same, uh, we, you, because the surface of the coin is so limited, we sometimes find the entire title, or most often the first symbol that precedes the royal name. In the Phoenician alphabet, also, the same title appears preceding the king's names on those kings who use the Phoenician script on their coinages, and that's milk, that's of the king, and then follows the name of the king. We will see several examples 
for the 5th and the 4th century BC coinages. In the 4th centuries, we have also the, the, pre the appearance and the first use of the Greek alphabet, which appears also on the coins, sometimes together with a Cypriot syllabic script, or uh, in some kingdoms it completely replaces the local script. But usually those kings who used to employ the Phoenician script do not adopt at all the Greek legends on their coins. They remained faithful to the Phoenician language up to the demolition of the kingdoms at the end of the 4th century BC. So uh, what is the name of the main unit of the coins? What is very interesting is this lead weight that weighs 42.20 grams that was inscribed and had the following inscription in Cypriot syllabic script, Pa, that could be the initial of the royal title, Ni, we don't know which king, there are several kings whose name starts from Ni, Four, C, actually if we divide the weight of this weight with four, which is the number indicated on it, we have a unit of 10.55 grams, which is the theoretical weight of the siglos of the local heaviest coins of the 5th century BC. Actually, the local weight standard, and that's something that we're trying to really understand by doing my next big project, is the coin dice studies of all the silver coinages, the same way I did for the gold, in order to really understand what's going on in terms of coin dice studies for all these different kingdoms and kings. But the heaviest unit is the Siglos, whose name is known from this one epigraphic testimony, but it's normal to understand that this, the C could be completed as Siglos. And it weighs around 11 grams, which is attested by several coinages that we have of the, of the fifth century BC in various kingdoms. The Siglos in Cyprus is divided in thirds, sixths, twelfths, 24th down to 96th of the siglos. And although it is often described as a Persian, as Persian weight standard, this cannot be confused with the standard of the Persians because the Persian siglos of circa 5.5 grams is not the double of that unit, which is as a unit 11 grams. But of course, one should not understand that it facilitates an easy exchange with the Persian Sigloi because Cyprus is under Persian rule and uh, they, according to the sources, they had to pay a tribute to the Persian king, maybe also partially in coin money, but uh, also a Cyprus in, is in contact with all the Inonian cities and all the Eastern and the Western world. So this coinage and this weight standard can be very well proved and explained, at least for the 5th century. So the 5th century is a century of changes and there are so many different coinages in the Cypriot kingdoms that I will try to present some characteristic examples without <laughs> providing you too much information because it's an overload of information. Uh, just a small overview of different coinages of different kingdoms. And I will start from Salamis, where actually we have Herodotus mentioning uh, on his fifth uh, book of histories that uh, the period that followed the Ionian revolt, that's at the very early fifth century BC, uh, Onesilos was the brother of Gorgos, son of King Herses, son of King Syromos, son of King Evelton. So uh, Herodotus provides us the genealogy of the kings of Salamis, but unfortunately we cannot attribute coins to any of those kings, apart from Evelton, who, to whom can be attributed those coins. The earliest issues, they represent on the obverse uh, ram, and the earliest issues are, are smooth on the reverse, while later on we have an Ankh, the Egyptian symbol of life, represented on the reverse with several Cypriot syllabic signs that are very, very problematic up to now. 
Um, on the obverse, we do have two variations of the legend. Either the name of Evelthon in nominative, that is of Evelthon, either his name in genitive, which is very interesting because the name, those coinages that have the name of Evelthon in genitive go down to the middle of the 5th century, that's 100 years almost, which is impossible for Evelthon to be alive during that long period of time. And it is possible that the successors of Evelthon, who do not correspond to the genealogy given by Erodotus, unfortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> we don't know, but these names cannot be found in any of those signs on the reverses, this dynasty continues to, to, to link themselves to Evelthon, who probably was the founder of the dynasty, which is why his name appears in genitive on the reverse. And we do have a lot of testimonies out of hoard evidence for the dating of those coinages, because otherwise it would be impossible to have a time, a, a specific dating or at least an approximative dating for those issues. But what is very interesting is that we also discover several names who are otherwise unknown, and this is the case for most of the Cypriot coinages, that most of the royal names are known to us exclusively from the coin production, which makes of the coins, for the case of Cyprus, a very, very convincing primary source for the ancient history of the island. And uh, I will show you some examples where 87% of the king's names are exclusively known to us from coins, <laughs> which is a, an important number. And uh, Horgos, for example, and Fafsis, and Nicodemus, these three kings are uh, known to us exclusively from their coin production. Uh, discovered in hordes and uh, in collections. Somebody read the name and things started being clean, clear, at least for that uh, coinage. And Avanthis as well. So we do have three kings who are otherwise unknown and several coinages minted by kings whose names we cannot really understand or uh, read. And uh, so, from the seven kings mentioned in Herodotus, only to one, Velthon, we have attributed coins with certainty. The coin legends saw Velthon's names in genitive, which means that they should be attributed to his successors, whose names on the coins do not match the list given by Herodotus. And the coinages of Velthon's successors, such as Fafsis, Nicodemus, and Evanthes, are the only testimonies for the existence of these kings that reigned in, the Sal in Salamis in the period between 475 and 430, according to Hort testimonies. In Kition, we have a completely different way of understanding the early dynasties, because actually in Kition we have this inscription that was found in Idalion, where Valmilk, king of Kition and Idalion, appears to be the son of Ozibal, king of Kition and Idalion, son of Balmilk, king of Kition. So the father is Balmilk I, who has a son, and whose grandson, as we, we do today, has the same name of the father. And actually what's interesting is the possession of these kings. Balmilk is only king of Kition, Ozibal is king of Kition and Idalion, that's one of the kingdoms that appeared to be active in the 7th century, but does not appear to be active anymore in the 4th century. And Valmilk II continues to be king of Kition and Idalion. And actually, we know that the kings of Kition conquered Idalion because Idalion stops issuing autonomous coinages in the middle of the 5th century. And a little bit before that date, we have the tablet of Idalion, one of the most, the most extensive document in Cypriot syllabic script. Uh, that's a two-side inscription that was dedicated in the temple of Athena in Idalion by the king and the city of Idalion after uh, an attack 
which was not successful, by the Kitians. So these guys tried to do to do uh, to conquer the Ida Italian with the help of the Persians, but did not succeed. And they did not succeed because otherwise this thing would not have been engraved. But later on, it appears that they managed to do so because we know that Italian stopped issuing coins and the excavations at the Acropolis of Italian have revealed the great Phoenician archive uh, which will be published very soon, we hope. Yeah, we, we are expecting for the excavation and the archive. It's a financial archive of the kings of Kition that was discovered in Italian. So Italian was used as a financial district for the kings of Kition after the conquest. And uh, so the kings of Kition have a completely different iconography on their sigloi and their smaller fractions with Heracles Milkart. He's represented with the attribute of Greek Heracles. So we see the Leonti, we see the bow, and we see the club. But he's assimilated with the Phoenician god Milkart in Kition, where the cult is attested from archaeological evidence as well. On the reverse, we have this seated or standing lion with a winged solar disc and the Phoenician bulk. That's the initial of the king's name. And while Ozibal, who's his successor, his son and successor, actually changes the reverse, representing a lion devouring a stag, which is the iconography that will be adopted by all the successors of the dynasty of Kition down to 312 when the, ki the kingdom is demolished by Ptolemy I at the early Hellenistic period. So Balmilk II, he adopts the same iconography. It's only the name of the king that changes in the coinage of the kings of Kition. And Idalion, for the 50 coins, for the 50 years that issued coins from the early 5th century down to the middle of the 5th century, the characteristic type is the sphinx and the lotus flower uh, with astragaloi and uh, with uh, signs in Cypriot syllabic script that reveal the name of four kings whose names are known only by the first one or two syllables of their names. So only the king that is mentioned in the tablet of Idalion, that is Stasikipros, could be completed with a sa on some of the coins. Sata Siki Pros in Cypriot syllabic script. All the, we, uh, the numismatists and the archaeologists are in constant quarrel <laughs> because the archaeologists would like to date the conquest of Kiti or of Idalion by Kition and the destruction of the Acropolis er as early as the 480s, which is impossible according to her testimonies because Ozibal, who is the one who conquered Idalion, his coinage is dated in the middle of the 5th century. It cannot be dated earlier than that, according to court testimonies. So <laughs> we cannot <laughs> conclude. But the coins tell that it's in the middle of the 4th century, of the 5th century, excuse me. In Amathus, another city, kingdom of Cyprus, the coin types are completely different as well. We see the lions as a main type, a uh, lying lion and the forepart of the lion with the names of the kings in Cypriot syllabic script. This is Zotimo. In Amathus, Amath Amathus is the only kingdom where the language, a Teo Cypriot language, which cannot be read, we don't know, it's a local language of Cyprus that uses the same signs and, as the Cypriot syllabic script. But actually, when we cannot read. <laughs> What we see, we understand that it's the other uh, language that uh, appears on those coins. And uh, these are the coins of Roikos, who is the only king of Amathus. All the other kings are exclusively known from their coin production. Uh, Roikos, actually, we have only this sign, Ro. We know of a king, Roikos, in Amathus, who sent. Um, grain to Athens in the middle of the fifth of the, of the fourth century, but the coins are dated far be before that date, which makes 
the literary and the numismatic testimonies not corresponding very well with each other. Uh, but for many, many years these coins were dated because of the existence of that literary source uh, down to the middle of the 5th century, which cannot be the case anymore because of the, well, the, the dating of these coins at the end of the 5th century, so 50 years earlier than that. And then at Lapithos, again, we have a completely different iconography with no legends, which made very difficult for us to understand the attribution of the earliest coins with no legends to this kingdom. And actually, some of these coins were as early as being included in the Persepolis hoard, so as early as the, the first years of the, of the end of the 6th century. The dating is still <laughs> debatable, but these are very early coins. So these coins can be linked, actually. The same reverse can be linked with this head, which reminds the types of these heads of the, of the middle of the 5th century. And we do have these characteristic types of the head of Aphrodite and the head of Athena with no legends. And then we have this coin with the name in Phoenician, the Monikos or the Monikos. And another name, Balzacor, the kings of Lapithos tend to use just the Phoenician script on their names. And then we have this coin which is one of the weirdest and very particular coinages of Cyprus, not only because in the middle of the 5th century we do have a facing head with such detail on those coinages that... But also the coin legends in Phoenician attest not only the name of the king, but also the name of the kingdom, which is <laughs> we're very lucky because we can really attribute with certainty those coins. And this is something that it's not very common as a way of, you know, coin legends in Cyprus uh, or in general. And this king, because probably he considers that on one side this is not enough, he repeats his name on the reverse as well. On this, th this head is described as a um, Athena head with um, bull's ears in a very peculiar crown and with crests, of course. Uh, Herodotus mentions that the Psidians were used to wear helmets like that. Mm -hmm. But this has nothing to do with Cyprus in terms of iconography. This is a very peculiar iconography. And this is a very peculiar iconography too in another kingdom, that is the kingdom of Marion, where the ethnic is mentioned on the reverse, Mariefs. But what's very interesting is that this king, he wants to mention the name of his father as well, which is very peculiar. And what is also peculiar is that Sasmas is a Phoenician name, and the name of the father is Greek. So maybe there were some issues with dynasties and ethnic <laughs> mixtures, which obliges the, the king to really do that in terms of, of numismatic legend. But what's very interesting also is the choice of the reverse iconography, which is very much inspired by a mythological scene, which is represented on the coins in the same way as on the Attic vases that are very common in the Kingdom of Marion. The most important numbers of Attic ceramics were found in this city. So they were very much probably inspired by uh, Athenian ceramics and the entire representation. So th in this king, sorry, we have Phrixus on the ram, which is represented with quite some detail in this Cypriot style, but uh, they're trying to represent this theme. And the successor of this king, and we know of the dating because of her evidence, Actually, he changes completely the reverse type. His name is Tasikos, and uh, one can read clearly his name on the reverse, Pasile Wose Satasi Woikone. Sorry. 
but I think it's interesting to also see how the legend can, can read in the script. And then here, we do have another mythological scene. For several years, the, this was considered to be a starter, but it's definitely Aphrodite, uh, uh, Europe, sorry, and the bull. And it, she's represented on the way also in several forms of art. Europe is floating, catching the, the corn of the animal while flying. And it's very interesting how two successive kings <laughs> actually are using mythological themes that uh, the one is traveling towards the east and the other one is traveling towards the west. And in Paphos, again, we do have a completely different iconography. Uh, these are the earliest coinages. There was a discussion whether to attribute those coinages to the kings of Paphos or not because of the name Syromos. You can see just the Se at the end with an astragalos. But the following coinages of Paphos are easier to identify. We do have the bull and the eagle, just the head with various names of kings. Mm. We do know of 19 kings for the 5th and 4th century, 85% exclusively known out of coins. Some of them, six of them, are also mentioned in inscriptions, and only two of them in the texts of the historians. And uh, here you can see also some very symbols that they, the Cypriots like that are inspired from the Eastern art, the mirror, the young and uh, the name of the king with a nice jar <laughs> on the field. So, sorry, that's pa Pasi, so that's the royal title. Satasa, Stasandros, Pasi, the royal title, almost always appears there. So, these are the types that are adopted by the different kings whose dating has been clarified through hoard evidence and Anders Struberger Yadis has made a lot of work on that and on other various subjects of the uh, Cypriot coinages. And we also have many, many issues that, as one can imagine, are definitely Cypriot because we do have the signs in Cypriot syllabic script, but because there is no continuity in the iconography it is impossible to attribute them, and we don't know of, of practically any king's names. It's impossible to complete the names or attribute them to a kingdom. This is a very, very particular coin that has been discovered recently in a hoard found in Nicosia that uh, had uh, 35 coins uh, of a king fee. We do know these issues as well from other hoard evidence, uh, like the Asut hoard, with these same signs, could be the same king, but these are very, very early coinages of the same period. Uh, and the Struper who studied the hoard, said that these coins could have been, because the hoard was found in Nicosia, where the ancient kingdom of Lydra was, she concluded that maybe these coinages could be attributed to the kingdom of Lydra that after the Ionian revolt's outcome in Cyprus. And uh, th there have been changes in the numbers of the kingdoms and probably kingdoms that were active then were not active later on. That's possible, but there's no way of proving that for now. This is a completely new type that we didn't really know of. We did have examples of not as well re retain the, the type. So we knew the type, but it was very abimated, how we say, we say abimated. So it was very, we couldn't really tell the, the details. But it is as if this is this female figure with the hands embracing the winged solar disk. Uh, there were discussions about Astarte, but it's a very particular iconography. And um, also, this hoard has been published on the website of Keep Your Character together with 
other papers related to, to such issues of uh, Cypriot numismatics and not only. Also, there are these coins of Aristophantos. The name is there. Just, we could read it in one coin, but we don't know of the kingdom. Again, you see this same lion, very, very archaic, early fifth, end of the sixth, early fifth century head of a lion. And these coinages that were long considered to be of Golgi, but uh, uh, John has uh, shown that this sign should definitely be read as Ko and not as Go. And he proposed to attribute those coins to Kurion. Uh, unless there are more detailed inscriptions, this is definitely a suggestion and a proposal that it's worth thinking of. But as is the problem with so many open questions, we can only ask the questions and make the proposals. But we really don't know that much about those early coinages without complete legends. But even if we do have complete legends, again, <laughs> there are so many questions related to those. So these were the problems of the, four, the fifth century coinages of Cyprus and a general overview. But let's see these coins as well, where you can see Heracles fighting the lion, probably again the scene of mythological scene, and Athena, very detailed with an aflaston seated on the pro with the Cypriot syllabic legend Passi of the king Ari. These coins are dated in the middle of the fourth century. We have absolutely no idea of the kingdom or the king who issued those coins. So the, co the problem of attribution continues down to the fourth century. And uh, here I'm showing you this, co the, actually, these disappearing kingdoms. We know that Idalion was conquered by Kition because Idalion ceases to exist in the middle of the fifth century. We will see in the fourth century how Kition acquired also Tamasos but lost it at some point. And for Lydra and Hitri, we don't know how they disappeared, but probably they were absorbed by Salamis in the early 5th century BC. So the 4th century, things become more complex, although we have more information and we have more historical information uh, uh, about Cyprus because of Avagoras I, who is a very notorious king, uh, being involved in many, many events of the early 4th century BC. But also we know of Alexander's control of Cyprus, so uh, Cyprus becomes part of the international scene of events, and also Ptolemy the first, the first wants to conquer Cyprus and uses the island as uh, an avant-première for many of, of his um, things to, to follow, also for uh, the adoption of the royal title through his brother Menelaus. So the weight standard changes Actually, some kings continue to use the 11 gram seed loss, but uh, the, Ro the Rhodian or Kian weight standard is also adopted by some of the kings of the in the 4th century. And uh, it is based on tetradrachms and mainly didrachms of 7 grams in Cyprus. Also, in Cyprus, the kings issue gold coins as early as the early 4th century BC. Some more and some less systematically, but uh, uh, the, the weight follows that of the Daric and it's divided in thirds, sixths, twelfths in some kingdoms and in other kingdoms in halves, tenths and twentieths, which, ex which is explained by the fact that the gold coinage is complementary to the silver coinage to cover the needs in money in specific times for these kings. So uh, the ratio, excuse my, <laughs> it's ratio. Um, the ratio between gold and silver in the early fourth century was one to 13.33, and that's completely proved through the study of the Cypriot coinages. But later on, it drops after Alexander to one to 10. And this also proposes excellent exchanges between gold and silver coinages in Cyprus. So 1 to 12, which was a, 
in the period of, of Philip is not attested in Cyprus, at least from what we know of. So, let me show you an example. So, 8.44 grams times 13.33, which is the ratio before Alexander, makes us a total of 11, uh, 112 grams of silver. If we divide that with 11 grams, which is the theoretical weight of the Cypriot Cyclos, we have, for one gold coin of 11.44 grams, 10 Cycloi. And if we want to see that with coins, actually the one-tenth of a Vagoras coin equaled one of his silver Cycloi, which is very well explained in the numismatics of Salamis and of Evagoras. Later on, when the ratio drops and uh, it goes down to 10, for one gold coin we have 84.40 grams of silver. And if we divide that with the Roitian or um, Didrachma, because this is seen with kingdoms that adopt the Rhodian weight standard, we have for one gold coin 12 Didrachms. And actually, for one gold standard of Nicocreon, king of Salamis, this would equal 12, 12 of his didrachms. So this also is explained in time the, the, and with the examples of Cypriot coinages, this change of ratio in Cyprus, and it's proven very well from these examples that I've tried to show you today. So, except from the gold coins, of course, we have bronze coins and smaller denominations of silver coins, which is also visible in the hoard evidence. We have um, the new weight standard. We have Greek coin legends, but also we have the preservation of the Cypriot syllabic script and the Phoenician script. And new iconographic types. We have new dynasties. We have the adoption of uh, new gods and uh, heroes. And in Salamis, the earliest coins of the 5th century are those attributed to Evagoras I with the head of Heracles and the ram, and who is the first who combines the Cypriot syllabic script, Basileose of the king, Epsilon, Ypsilon, these are the two names, the initials of his name in Greek. And um, Evagoras is also the first king of Salamis who is issuing gold coins that in theory, theoretically are tenths and twelfths of uh, and twentieths of a uh, stutter, but in uh, in, <laughs> in reality, they were far lighter than the theoretical weight of those uh, denominations, and also their uh, contenance in gold was far less than <laughs> uh, the the percentage that could be acceptable. For example, these are the kings of Salamis. And the coins of Evagoras are have a percentage of gold that's far below 90%, which is explained by the fact that the king manipulated the gold coinage to gain in precious metal. So he produced a coinage that was not good in terms of weight and was not good in terms of quality of gold. Um, while Evagoras is reigning in Salamis, in Kition, it's Milkiathon, the king who is ruling for 30 years, according to epigraphic evidence, who is also issuing gold coins with uh, a 99% of purity in gold. So he's probably getting his gold from another source, and he's very well. In, he's in very good contact with the Persian king as well. So he he probably finds his gold from there. Uh, he's also the first king in Kition to issue bronze coins with the same Heracles but with Aphrodite. The son and successor of Evagoras, who succeeds his father in 373, he changes completely the iconography. So nothing reminds us of Heracles that his father had uh, on his coin. And uh, Nicocles, not only he changes the iconography completely, but he produces a very clean coinage that touches 99% and great in, in weight. So actually, I believe that because his father's coinage, P, 
people understood that it was not a good coinage at some point. His son tried to really do a monetary change in Salamis and he wanted to produce a very good gold coinage, which actually is very high in gold and very good in weight. Uh, his successor as well produces gold coins, Evagoras II. Uh, we first hear of him as he is collaborating with the Persians and the Athenians to return to the throne because another king is ruling in Salamis. And actually this is the coinage that he produced in Cilicia to finance his return to the throne. <laughs> this is the guy who succeeded him. We don't know how. But he's the one ruling while Evagoras II tries to return to the throne. He's Pnitagoras and he introduces this new iconography for the gold coins with Aphrodite and a male head. For years we thought that this was considered to be an Aphrodite, but by uh, looking at all the different elements that create this figure, this is a crown that can only be found in male heads in Cyprus. In Cyprus it is very common to have earrings as jewellery and we have many representations of male heads with earrings in Cyprus as well and as, as in the Achaemenid world. And of course this male figure wears a torque, that's an open necklace that is known to be a characteristic of the high hierarchy people, the people that are very important. They have important status, they are not gods. No gods repre god representations with a torque in the classical period un are known. So here we either have the representation of the founder of the city, who is Tefkros for Salamis, or the image of the king, not with the characteristics of a portrait, but with the uh, jewelry, the official jewelry of uh, specific um, purposes. If we were in Paphos, the kings of Paphos were also the high priests, according to epigraphic testimonies, of Anasa, of Aphrodite, in the famous uh, sanctuary of Aphrodite. But we cannot generalize this theory because this is Salamis and Salamis could be completely different. So, but it is interesting that all the following kings for their gold coinages, they adopted the same iconography. And even this guy who is Menelaus, he's the brother of Ptolemy the first, who, although he's not a member of the royal family of Salamis, he adopts the iconography, and even he remembers the Cypriot syllabic script as a means of political propaganda, definitely, of the Ptolemies. Uh, all the other kings were using the Greek script, but he remembers the royal sign. And he issues coins as the last king of Salamis, definitely before 306, when all the kingdoms cease to exist. The last king of Kittim is Pimiathon, who is ruling for, si for 46 years. And not only we do have his title and areas of control in inscriptions that were found in Kittim and Idalion, but also, like the kings of Phoenicia, he adds the regal year on his coins, which is very, very practical for us. <laughs> And uh, with some gaps we do know of coinages that go from year 3 to year 46. And um, what is very interesting is that this king, he also becomes king of Tamasos, which he loses at some point between the 21st and the 34th of his year. And we know why. We know why, actually this is another, is Timarchos, King of Paphos is a very rare example with a parallel of the Cypriot Kalathos represented on the coins. But this is how we learn how uh, he lost Tamasos. Duris mentions that Alexander, that's Alexander the Great, after uh, Tyr, he gave Pnitagoras, he is one of the Salaminian kings with a male head on the rivers, he gave to Pnitagoras gifts, but also a village that Pythagoras, uh, that uh, Pythagoras had asked from Alexander. That village, Pasikipros, the ruling king, 
he sold it for the price of 50 talents to Pygmalion of Kition, that's definitely Pimiaton, the king of Kition. So the poor king of Kition purchased the kingdom of Tamasos, but Alexander, he gave it as a present to the king of Salamis, and we know why. We know that Pimiathon helped Tyr because Tyr was the metropolis of Kition. And we know that Pimiathon, on the year of the Battle of Tyr, that's the year 30 of his reign, he issued the most important number of gold coins probably to finance the city that was against Alexander. And Alexander, of course, punished the Cypriot king. Uh, at the end of the 4th century, all most all the acting kings issue gold coins, which is explained because after Alexander we have a flow of metal in Cyprus as well as in other areas. You can see some beautiful parallels of these earrings that were found in Curion and their representation on some gold coins of Paphos and these very particular coins that are fake, <laughs> some of them are fake, and uh, are thought to be of the last king of Kition. Two of them that I've seen personally are not good. There are not many examples known. One of them was sold rather recently. We don't know. <laughs> But it's a weird type compared to whatever we've seen in terms of style and i in Cyprus. And uh, bronze coinages as well, they're very important, but in the terms of today's presentation, I will finish very shortly. I didn't want to bother you also with bronze coins, which are also <laughs> problematic, not as, as beautiful for such uh, a general presentation. And just a few things about coin circulation and coin data to, to finish this presentation. Four important hordes that cover the entire archaic and classical period were found in Cyprus in proximity to the main kingdoms, uh, dated from 480 to 350, the burial dates. What is very interesting that is that out of 2,000 coins, that was the total of coins in those four hordes, 99% was Cypriot coins. So Cyprus appears to be a very limited, uh, it works a little bit, sorry, like a recycling factory. Actually, this does not mean that foreign coins did not circulate in Cyprus, but as soon as they entered the island, because the island did not have any, any silver, they were used to uh, produce local coinage. And we do have also several examples of overstrikes of Athenian and Aegean coinages in Cyprus as well as overstrikes of neighboring areas, so they are in shortage of silver. And, um, but what's also very interesting is that Cypriot coins were found in hordes, mainly in Egypt and in Phoenicia, but also in Asia Minor and in Cilicia. Only in the East, not even one single Cypriot coin was ever found in the West, which is also very interesting because it shows the direction of the money and the Cypriot, the Cypriot coinage. And these are some important hoards that are dated during that period, where coinages of mostly Salamis, Kition, and unidentified coins, especially for the early periods, are found, but also Italian, Lapithos, Amathus, and Paphos are represented. Uh, on Cypriot's character, if you visit the website and you go into the article section, One can find some numismatic papers that were included in today's presentation. The History of the Study of the Coinage by Anders Ruber Georgiadis, a general presentation of the coinages of Cyprus, some things on the analytical methods and the composition of the coins by uh, Haralampus Andreas, Uh, Popilidis, who is the excavator of the hoard that was found in Larnaca, uh, is presenting that. And some things on the coinages of Ptolemies by Julien Olivier and of the Roman coinages of Cyprus by Michel Lamantry. There are other art articles to come. And um, also, and that's something that's really interesting, is that uh, in the section coins, 
One can search for Cypriot coins of the archaic and classical periods from museums. The American Mismatic Society's collection will soon be added in this section. And one can actually look at the coins either by collection or by doing specific searches. And one can get more details about uh, each one of the coins together with the legends in Cypriot syllabic script and the nomisma links, which is also very helpful for the collaboration between researchers and the museums and foundations. So thank you very much. I hope this wasn't too much information. <laughs> <laughs>